Okay, so to continue from my part one video, uh, my recording software just allows me to record 10 minutes, so I have to continue this in a part two. Uh, I'm too lazy today to edit and make them all in one video, and it's gonna be a long video tutorial, if it's just gonna be one video. So I was talking about the step and the increment size, and the simple thing is that uh, you have to reduce the increment size for initial step so that the evolution of this uh, deformation is slow, starts slow, and that reduces errors and allows the software to calculate uh, faster and get to accurate results. Uh, when the software has an error in the calculation, it jumps to a smaller step size, and it keeps reducing that time step until this value here, so you can even reduce this to a smaller value if you wanted to work on a nano scale of step size in nanoseconds, and it will keep uh, simulating until it gets to the maximum value or the final value, which is supposed to be one. And here, the time period is one. Uh, then every time it does a step, it calls it as it uh, records it as an increment. So if it's gonna do a 0 0.1 steps, it's gonna need 10. So these are gonna be 10 increments. If it's gonna face problems, it's gonna need more than 10, and the limit for that is 100. If the software reaches 100 and it doesn't get a solution yet, it will just stop and give you an error. If it keeps reducing the size of the steps to get to this value and it wants to go even lower, then it will stop and also give you an error. So if you expect your simulation to need very small steps and very big number of increments, then you should reduce this time and increase this value to, let's say, 1,000 or 10,000. doesn't really matter. You just increase it. And that's it for the step. So now we have the pot. We have the material. The material is assigned to it. We have the type of step, it's gonna be static. And the next step, the next phase of this is to usually add interactions, uh, which are if you have several parts, in this case you only have one part, so there would be no interaction with another part. So we skip the interactions and we go to the loads. So we, we need to do a tensile test here. So to do a tensile test, you need to hold one edge of this part and load the other edge. And to do this, you go to this uh, feature which is boundary condition. Uh, when you fix an edge or move an edge, these are called the boundary condition in simulation. And in this case, you call this boundary condition as fixed edge. And you can here select uh, uh, here, the first option, default, is if you have a symmetry case or an incast. Incast is another way to say not allowed to move or fix. So when you click continue on this option, uh, it asks you to select the edge. So I'm going to rotate and click on the bottom edge I want to fix. Click done. And then I have the options of what limitations I want to do on that surface. So I can limit the motion uh, on the x direction. So u1 is set to 0. And I will also be limiting the rotations of any nodes on that surface. So the rotation on 2 and 3, which is the rotation x and y and z, will be limited to 0. But in this case, I just want the bottom edge to stop moving, but I'm still allowed to rotate any node on that surface, so I'll just do a pin. And here you see these uh, uh, orange colored arrows that uh, show you that this surface is supposed to be pinned and not allowed to move. And I would like to move the upper surface. I would like to make this upper surface move upward. So this is uh, when it's about motion, not about a force. So here you can enter a force value in this tutorial, I'll just do a motion value, which is a displacement value. So I'll call this the displacement. And this, I'll select the displacement here, or rotation. And then if I click continue, it'll ask me which surface I want to have a displacement for. I'll select the surface and click done. Now I get the options also, like which directions do I want this surface to move. And obviously in this case, I want it to move upward. And you can see here the reference orientations. So the Z direction is downward, and I want this to move upward. So I'll use the U3, which stands for the third one, the Z. And I'll enter a negative value because I want it to go opposite the axis. So Z is going downward. I want it to go up. So I'll use a negative value. The total length of this part is 50 millimeters. So for now, I'm just going to move it 5 millimeters, just 10% of the length. And this is a strain of 0.1 if you translate it into strains. Uh, this option is important in some other simulations, not this case too much. 
So here, this displacement will not be uniform. It will not move uh, every one-tenth of a second. It will not move one-tenth of the distance. Because I'm using a ramp approach, which means it will slowly start to move, and then it will slow down when it, need to, when it needs to stop. This is usually preferred in dynamic loading, because you don't know we need very high accelerations and very high deceleration. And a static motion, that wouldn't make any much difference. There's no inertia, there's no dynamic effects, there is no kinetic energy. But I'll keep it as ramp, and it will not influence the results. You can choose other options here, so you can create amplitudes and define it the way you want. This will probably be in a more advanced tutorial later. So now it's going to be moving minus 5. I'm going to click OK. And then you can see the orange arrows uh, indicate that this part is going to be moving upward. So now you know I fixed it, and I'm going to move it upward. The next step is to mesh the part. So in any simulation, you need a part with a mesh. You need to have mathematical points on which the software will calculate. So this is a general geometry that actually only have four points in the bottom and four points in the top. So this, this is not a complete uh, uh, enough mesh to calculate. So by default, the easiest way to create the mesh for this part is to go to the uh, seed the part instance. So this seeds a lot of points on the part. So as you've seen, if I click it, I get this error. Because here, I'm, I'm viewing this object in an assembly. And the meshing has to be done for a part, not the assembly. Because you have to mesh each part on its own. So I have to click on part here, so I switch to a part view, and I go back to this feature, and now I can seed it. And the default global size, so the distance between two dots on this part, is going to be 5, because the total length is 50. And for this simulation, this is OK. You can decrease it to a lot lower value, like 1. This gives you, could give you more accurate results. And you could increase it to 10 or 50, even if you don't want that much of an accurate result. But it's always good not to decrease it too much, so you save time on simulation, and not to increase it too much, so you have more accurate simulation. So 5 is a kind of a recommended value, and it's based on the total length of the part, which is, again, 50. So this is one-tenth one of the length. You don't need to play with these other values, but these are to optimize this distribution. For example, these nodes will be equally spaced, and you can change that by changing those values here. So if I click Apply, you'll see those expected seeds. Then I click OK. So I have seeded it. And then I just need to mesh the part. And it asks me if I want to mesh. I'll just need to say yes. And it quickly meshes it. So the width is 15. And that's why you have two nodes. And the other side is 10. So that's why you only have a node in the center, because the distance between nodes, we want it to be 5. So now I have a meshed part. So I have the part, I have the material property, I have the assembly, I have the step settings, the load, the mesh, and I just need to create a job and let it run. And create a job, I go to the job menu, and I click here, create a job. I call it, again, test, test one. It's always preferable to add a date, so you can add a date, but do not put dots in the date. Always put underscores, because dots uh, create a conflict. The software does not accept them in the name. Just click Continue. Default values are always good. The only thing you might need to change is to add the processors. So by default, you're using two processors. If you know your PC has more, uh, or workstation, or whatever you're using, server, you can use more cores. So in my case, I know I have four, so I'll be using four. You can also uh, let your GPU take part of the simulation, but this is too simple to put too much processor power into. So I'll click OK. And here in this table, I'll have the job here. And I'll describe this table later. So I have the job here. And I right click, and I just need to submit the job. And now it's submitted. It's running the simulation. And you can also see the status of the simulation. You need to right click on it and click on monitor. So now you can see what's happening with the simulation. And it shows you a log, errors, if any, not a thing yet, warnings, if any. The output file is going to be this file. And the data file describes what's happening in the process, what's being calculated, what's the setup. And there's more to talk about this, but it'll definitely be in later simulations. And here you can see the increments. So this took uh, just those increments, so it didn't take too many. 
and the total time it was increasing 